Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Midland Golden Retriever Tea Time Chat. Really, really excited to welcome you all this evening, but I'd like to start, first of all, with a small tribute to Valerie Foss, who had been a great mentor to me and many other people in the breed. She died um, in July this year, mm -hmm. and um, a great loss to the Golden Retriever world, as well as many other breeds. Um, so I just thought, I love this picture of Val um, with the English setters behind her at the Kennel Club. And uh, I just thought she did a great chat for us on the history of the breed. And I, you could just tell her mind was so sharp and she just absolutely knew her topic through and through. And if anybody would like to watch that again, it's available on our YouTube channel. So, you know, do do have a look at it because it's a real resource for people. So um, I'm really, really excited to in, introduce our um, expert panel. That's all I can say about these four very special judges um, that we've managed to recruit to do our talk tonight. We've got Sandra Patterson from Australia, Jose Doval from Spain, Jim Richardson from Scotland, and, and Becky Johnson from um, England. So um, I'd like to start just by asking you all to introduce yourself. Um, Sandra, would you like to start, seeing as how you're the furthest okay. away? <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. It's quite early in the morning here in Australia. Um, my name's Sandra, and... Uh, I uh, obtained my first golden retriever in 1968. So I've had over 50 years um, of great interest in the breed. Um, over that time, my husband and I have bred some uh, many champions here in Australia and in New Zealand, and we're very proud of that. Uh, have won specialties, royals, and all the other things that you do. Um, and as a judge, I've been judging since the early 70s. Um, I started off with Golden Retrievers, as we do here, and progressed through all the groups. And um, and now and Dogs Australia, or ANKC, all breeds judge, AKC, all breeds, and FCI, all breeds. And I've had the honour of judging Golden Retrievers in England um, and in many countries around the world, um, um, Sweden and um, South Africa, Asia, Japan, the UK and um, North America. So I've been able to see many of the various styles that are around. I think that's about all. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sandra. And Jose, can I ask Hello. you to introduce yourself to everybody? Hello, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm talking to you from Romania tonight because I'm, I've been judging this weekend here. Uh, well, I, I started in Golden Retrievers in 1991 together with my wife. And one year later, we started also with uh, Labradors. So we have been the last more than 30 years uh, very closely related with, with Retrievers. Also, um, I we were involved in the foundation of uh, the Retriever Club in Spain, where I've been uh, secretary for 10 years and then chairman for another 10 years, now only a uh, normal member. <laughs> and we have bred uh, always in a small basis because uh, normally we bred only when, when we want to keep something for us. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have had uh, several champions, uh, not only in Spain, but in, uh, in other countries and uh, some winners in uh, very important shows, especially in club shows. And uh, as a judge, I started to judge in the championship level in uh, 2000. And, uh, well, I've been judging um, mostly all over the world, including Australia and, and America, South America. Uh, so Goldens are a very, very important part of our life. And um, I'm very honored to be part of this of this uh, seminar tonight, of this panel tonight. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And we're so glad that you were able to join us. Thank you. Jim, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Richardson. I'm from that lovely country called Scotland, which is the home of our lovely breed okay. in the Highlands, uh, thanks to Lord Tweedmouth in, what, 1868? Uh, my first golden and my wife's first golden uh, was in 1977, which was a, a Camrose Christopher uh, daughter uh, mated to Lakin's uh, bitch. Um, she was a lovely bitch, beautiful head. Uh, it's not a head you see really nowadays, which is unfortunate. When you do see it, I usually remark on it. Um, we haven't bred. We've bred probably about 10 letters, no more. And... Um, we bred uh, own three show champions over the years. And, um, judging wise, I started uh, open shows in 1981. Uh, my first CC appointment was in 1991. Uh, that was at Bournemouth. Uh, the total to date is uh, there's a dispute over this. The Kennel Club uh, tell me on two counts that I've judged the breed on 30 occasions and. Uh, uh, another uh, kennel club say, say it's um, 28, but personally, I, I've done a calculation. I think it's 29 occasions in the UK. So that shows you how old I am. Uh, my first time overseas appointment was in Sweden in 1982. And today I've been very, very lucky to have judged in 31 different countries on 88 occasions. Uh, and I do keep sort of accurate records on that. So. I'm also the president of the Golden Retriever uh, Club of Scotland, on which I'm very honoured um, to have accepted a few years ago. Yeah. And I'm now passed for, uh, I've done two gun dog groups, um, and I'm passed for 13 CC breeds, including the, the gun dog group. And that's me. That's great. Thank you very much, Jim. Becky, tell us Hi. a little bit about yourself. I'm Becky Johnson. Um, Primarily downstream flat-coated retrievers, uh, which my parents created, and then my brother and I followed as an afterthought. Um, kennels produced twenty odd champions. I started judging about thirty years ago. I awarded my first set of CCs, obviously in flat coats, in two thousand and two. I'm passed for the Gundog Group and all thirty-one breeds within it. Um, admin, I was show secretary of the United Retriever Club for 13 years and I'm now vice chairman of Richmond Championship Dog Show. Oh, and I showed a Sussex, which I found one, uh, on a walk one day when I was walking the flat coats and persuaded the owners it ought to be shown and I showed him to his title and he also won the Vulnerable Breeds title at Crufts three years ago. Um, I've judged throughout Scandinavia and Europe quite extensively. My work prevents me going away as often as I would like. Um, I have got a loose connection to Golden Retrievers through my late godmother, uh, Lou Melville, the Crouchers Goldens. Um, and I always used to go be sent to stay with her for a month while her kennel maids were on holiday to be a free of charge skivvy. Um, she was quite bossy, actually, quite fierce, um, but I loved her to bits. And um, that's me. Yeah, I remember Lou well, and she really liked my um, Rocky. So I always had a soft spot for her. Yeah, yeah. And I remember her watching her working Xavier, I think it was, that she, one of her champions, she was worked in. Oh, yeah. I mean, she, 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 well. would, she would qualify her dogs in the field. Um, she often came to stay with us to you know, go picking up with my father because my father was a gamekeeper. Um, you know, she was quite a forceful character, but yeah. Well, um, when, she judged, when she judged Crufts, um, I'd broken my arm and it was on a, a plaster uh, and I was showing my dog and she whispered to me, uh, are you looking for the sympathy board? So <laughs> oh, she would. She was, quite, right. she was quite a character. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks very much for that, Becky. So just a quick little bit from me, if I uh, hang on. What are we here to talk about tonight? We Our theme is called the flat catcher revisited and many of you won't know what the flat catcher is. It was a term that I first came across reading this wonderful book by Mary Rosalind Williams and she uses this very old horse term um, 
which is really about a very flashy animal which has loads of showmanship which disguises his bad points so it's an animal that looks good but is not and she goes on to say that she's seen many flat catchers get their title simply through follow my leadership judging and I'm very very sad to say that I have also seen many flat catchers get their title too so it's some a topic that um, I'm really interested in in sort of discussing and debating and, and raising awareness of. Um, um, her daughter then um, talks a lot in in her section in in the second print of that book about the generic show dog. And she says they've often got a long neck, a steep upper arm, sloping top line and an overangulated quarters, which stands out far too behind the dog. They have busy movement and the more coat and furnishings, the better. And she's here talking about type and the fact that it, it can be very easily deviated away from. There's another great um, author, Richard Beauchamp, and he talks about type. He's got a book, actually, that's dedicated to it. And if you've not read it, I would really recommend it. And this is just a, a, a short extract from that. Yes, that flashy, never puts a foot wrong kind of dog. A dog will have his place in the ribbons when there are no dogs that excel in breed type and who are reasonably sound enough to be placed over it. But that is not what a judge is looking to do. Rewarding the dog whose only virtues are flash and soundness over one of correct type, who might be married only by a degree of unsoundness, is counterproductive to what breeding show quality animals is about. And then he then goes on and says, certainly you've seen that mixed breed dog trotting down the street, head held high, level top line, tail wagging happily behind him, glancing right and left as if he owns the world, his front legs reaching the hindquarters driving, all in perfect balance and coordination. What more could you ask of any dog, even though that's a mongrel? So quite an interesting thing to start to think about. Another fantastic book by a, a, a really, you know, judge that we really rarely see the likes of in this day and age, Tom Horner. So it's the first duty of breeders and breed judges to preserve the correct breed type and character in their particular breeds. A judge, so that he's then giving an example of something. A judge faced with two Irish terriers. One was oversized, slightly coarse, lack body and was slack all over, although moving straight and sound and was not too well presented or handling. handled. The other dog looked a picture. He was small with excellent confirmation, a good mover and clearly hours had been spent on his presentation. The oversized dog was placed first for he was typical Irish terrier, although not a particularly good one, with a racy outline and the masculinity one looks for in a male of this breed. The other was too small, too bobby, a pretty dog, but was way off Irish terrier type. The judge was right. It would have been quite wrong to put up an untypical dog. Very important and profound things. Um, sorry, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> so a lot of people sort of get a bit confused about type and say, what is it? Um, and the first thing I would say is, does it look like a golden retriever? It's important as that is the first, the first look you get as a dog when you are judging, tells you straight away whether the type is there or not. If it doesn't look like a golden retriever, it doesn't matter how good its confirmation is. If it doesn't have type, it's not a golden retriever. And you need to really work to train your eye to absolutely see type. So type is the characteristic qualities that distinguish a breed from another so a dog is a sum of all of those points that make a dog look like his own breed and no other. 
And here you have all the retrievers um, and you can see how different in type they all are. And they're all instantly recognisable. They are all good dogs within their breed, but they're all very, very easily to understand that they are from that breed. Going back to many, many, you know, the sort of the foundations of um, our standard and the, the sort of de early development of the breed, Mrs. Stonex was banging on about um, the whole aim of the standard is to produce goldens who will be suitable for their work of retrieving dead or wounded game, park days under all sorts of conditions so that the capabilities for speed and endurance with absolute soundness are necessary. And now we're talking a lot um, in the UK about dogs being fit for function. Well, she was absolutely talking about this in the, you know, 40s and 30s. And Mrs. Charlesworth, who was also a formidable character around that time, um, was talking about many of the faults that we see as being prevalent today, um, being long backs. They're, these faults are particularly confined to the show bench loungers, so you can tell what she thought about pure show dogs. And it's obviously that a dog with these defects cannot stand up to a hard season's work. And if you study confirmation, you'll understand the characteristics that are likely to make a dog mo more um, uh, sort of ergonomically sound and, and able to, to sustain the endurance that you would need for that. And this is sort of the final thing that I'm going to say, and this um, is from Raymond Oppenheimer, who again wrote some fabulous books and was obviously a very well-respected judge. And it's a very important point that no breed can long continue to progress if it's not if it's consistently badly judged, because sooner or later a general air of confusion will grow so that neither the experienced dog breeder nor the novice knows what to do next. It's therefore of great importance that everybody connected with shows should understand clearly what the term a good judge implies. There's a lot on this in the thing, but he goes on to explain if the wrong animals are put up consistently, they are liable to be chosen for breeding, which is likely to have a harmful effect on the breed concern. So it's very important that a high level of judging be maintained. Unless this happens, the general standard of the dogs will almost certainly deteriorate. And that's really, really, if you can get a hold of a copy of his books, get even though they're about terriers, they're, they're really interesting reading. So this time we handled our tea time chat a little bit differently. We reached out and asked for questions um, to prepare in, um, in, you know, sort of in preparation for this rather than asking for questions on the night. Now, if there is anything that comes out that we don't cover and you want any, or you want to ask anything else, please do feel to email me, but um, we aren't going to do an open questions and answer session tonight. What I have done, because there were a lot of questions and there were lots of different themes running through them, I've condensed them into a, a, a few sort of um, th pages of themes, if you like. And what we'll do is we'll start off with one of our panellists opening up and talking about this topic. And then obviously um, everybody else can pitch in and we'll have a talk about it. So this was the first um and really important question for tonight. Does any of the panel think the breed standard needs to be made more concise or change to define things like length of body, depth of chest and length of leg? Then somebody else had also emailed in and thank you everybody for questions. Goldens have been on breed watch in the UK this is for more than 10 years with causes for concerns. There's no proportions in the breed standard for the body. Should we just accept the shape has changed? So, Jose, would you like to start? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I think it's not necessary to introduce concise um, 
definition about the length of body, depth of chest, everything. I think I like very much um, the uh, British standards because they are uh, very open to interpretation. But if you have clear the image, the idea of the breed, you don't need to, to have all these points like happens, for example, in the German standards. In the FCI, the German standards always has this ratios and uh, exact uh, angle, angles angles and uh, sizes and everything and uh, at the end we are not producing machines it's not it's not a factory doing uh, chairs or tables always exactly the same there there is something more in breeding good dogs and breeding good do good goldens but it's necessary to have clear the image of a good golden and the image of this um of these proportions without being necessary to establish um, like for example in the in the american standard it said that uh, the length of body and height is a ratio of 12 to 11 um, but i think it's not it's not necessary it's not necessary and the problem is that, that you say if if the shape has changed um so a few years ago i read a very interesting article saying that the the competition is killing the the breed and not only in our side because always is is very easy to to say that uh, show people are guilty of of all the problems that the breed has i think that uh, after the second world war uh, the, the breed separate in two uh, worlds uh, the working world and the show world and both has made mistakes in this in all these years because um, people is more interested in competition and then show people is more interested in in more glossy dogs, more showy dogs with bone, with a coat and everything. And the um, people in the field uh, is interested in most uh, speed dogs, small dogs, uh, even more nervous than the, the standards say about the temperament. So we we should try to go again to a common way huh. and, yeah. and recover and recover what this, what the standards say if if uh, you read the standard you have a clear image of how the breed is and i think it's not necessary to do that kind of changes yeah yeah do you think we should accept though the change or do you think we should try and steer back to a more middle ground and and to what i would see as more correctness uh yeah i think there are exaggerations in both uh, in both uh, worlds in both sides of the yeah. of the breed so maybe maybe it's necessary to try to to go to a more moderate dog uh, both in the field and in the show ring yeah yeah i certainly agree with you when i've watched some of the labradors working they're more whip it than than uh <laughs> whip it than retriever but you know um I think it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 thank you very much has anybody any of the other panelists got anything to add to to this question there's hey, not uh, uh, there's not the word moderate mentioned once in our breed standard Whereas if you look at other breed standards, for instance, Weimaraners, there's eight or nine times it's mentioned, you know, moderate length of neck, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I think that has got to come. Otherwise, we're on a loser because things will just continue to be over-exaggerated because that's what a lot of people want. Mm. Um, in particular overseas, I, I would not say, uh, and in particular, <laughs> there's one gentleman in Holland who, who just argues night and day with me about we need more and more rear angulation. And I says, look, you, you don't need to turn them into German shepherds. It's, 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 not, it's not feasible. No. So I think the word moderate needs to be looked at in certain uh, aspects of the whole construction of the dog. Yeah, and of course, the over over angulation, as in the dog on the the outline of the dog on this slide, that is actually very uneconomical in the terms of, of movement. You know, a, a much more moderate stifle is a much stronger and endurance kind of stifle, um, and actually these are getting weak. I I think you're right, Jim. People's eyes are drawn 
naturally to exaggeration, things that stand out. And I think maybe that's where we're, we're, we've trained an eye to look for that because we've asked for more and more. Um, I can remember Hazel Hinks saying, I want more neck and shoulder angulation. I want more, more layback of shoulder and this more, more, more all the time. Um, I think we've kind of overshot the, the, the moderate dog that we should be. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, thank you. Sandra, you were going to say something before. Um, I agree with you, Jim, about the word moderate. And I think that it would be a good word to put in the standard. Um, I do think that we need uh, a more concise breed standard as far as proportions go so that it's there in writing. Uh, many years ago, it would be a good 10 years ago, Australia wrote to your breed council uh, yes. requesting proportions be put into the breed standard and the reply was it wasn't necessary because it's on breed watch. Well, here we are 10 years on and we have dogs tending to go towards exaggeration. And I think that judges, when they're reading the breed standard, if they're not familiar with the breed, they will remember out of anything is the proportions, the equal, um, you know, height to uh, withers and the length. If it's there in the breed standard, they'll remember that and they will look for it more than their interpretation of balance. And, and balance is an easy word, but um, many people don't agree on what is balanced and what is balanced. But when you when it's written in the breed standard, I just think that um, the judge, the people that are learning these things will remember that, which is now very important in the breed. Yeah, I can remember the application coming through or the discussion that came around the, the Australian proposal. And I do think in your, you, you've done some work around an extended breed standard, haven't you? And the pop proportions in that, which is really good. It's a really good piece of um, a really good resource for any judge who's in training. I think um, the Australian Extended Breed Standard. Uh, Penny, um, whilst the Extended Breed Standard is is very um, concise, a lot of judges don't read all of a breed standard and re uh, all of an extension of a breed standard and remember it, but they'd remember one page. And if in that page the word, as Jim said, moderate, and it was the the uh, required lengths and balance of the dog is there, they'll remember a page, but they won't remember 25 pages. Um, so I still think that I'd like to see the breed standard a little bit more concise. Yeah, yeah. Becky, you've got your hand yeah. up. I mean, the first thing is overall balance and functionality. Think you know, form follows function. Would the dog on the left be able to cross a field of plough with ease? I think not. I'm not, even, I'm not even sure I'd safety back it to get over a zebra crossing. But, I mean, you know, I've been around Goldens for many years, although I've only judged them once in this country with tickets, and they just seem to be getting shorter on the leg, um, longer in the back, overloaded on the shoulder even dare i say it over fronted i mean I, I you either get confronted with something with a front like the crest to run which a lot of judges seem to think is perfectly acceptable and it's back legs you know they're not even in the same postcode <laughs> i mean and I, that cannot I, be I, right I, that, I see, you've I got see, to bring moderate in yeah, that we're moving. A lot of the fronts are now more setter fronted, aren't they? Yeah, um, I mean, the thing is, you've got to remember as a CC judge, every time you give out a CC in whatever breed, you are endorsing that dog or bitch as a breeding prospect. And if so many people keep putting up the wrong type, more and more will follow. And then everybody will get the assumption that that is correct. And it not necessarily is. Yeah. And it, it's not just then for that dog, that concept then overspills into the breed you know and it, it's kind of almost sets a precedent doesn't it that you, you, that's, you, that's do, you, you don't as Jose said need to sort of be an engineer and say it's got to have this angle that angle this inch this up but I do believe some consensus of measurement wouldn't be a bad thing as how are people going to know what the length of the leg is in comparison you know from wither to elbow from elbow to foot mm. or how far back should the rib go? 
And yeah. what should the length of loin be? Because as we all know, a long loin is a weak loin. Overangulated hindquarters is not going to do the dog any favours at all. At oh, all, no, no. Thank you, Becky. Right. Penny, do you think that, uh, well, you've changed the uh, oh, go but going back, the dog on the right is obviously Christopher, am I right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Do you think Christopher would, would win in today's climate? He wouldn't be flashy enough. That to me is a golden retriever. That's what I was brought up with. Yeah, I, I am. Um, I, I first last time I did dogs, I was, I, I he would have won under me. All right. You know, um, definitely. I, I think the breed has changed, and I think there are, um. I, I think it it's it's very difficult, isn't it, to quantify that and cut him out and stick him in with what the dogs that we've got now. They do, I think they're much heavier overall and much more boned and bigger in the head, maybe, than, than the older dogs were. Um, would he win under you, Jim? I don't know. I would like you just a little bit more forechest on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 would, I would agree about the front. I was looking at the picture when we did our rehearsal earlier, and I thought, hmm, I yeah. just wonder if you could have a little bit more length of upper arm. Yeah, yeah, I think he is slightly up, up in. I, I didn't ever have my hands on him, so I, I can't speak what he was like. Um, I do think trimming has changed since those days. I mean, I, I can remember... Um, the, you, you know the the lady Lucille Sortel coming out with some of her dogs, and they'd never seen a pair of scissors. You know, and they were <laughs> early and and you know had had half a mane. Um, and obviously, you wouldn't see dogs that were you would. Most of the modern um, exhibitors would have taken an awful lot more coat off Christopher's neck and possibly left more on his fore chest. Which and that creates a slightly different look. It yeah. kind of lengthens the dog. Yeah. Um, and and so I think maybe trimming styles, you know, um might might make a bit of a difference, you know. Uh it's difficult because it's the all-round dog, isn't it? And until you see something moving, breathing, you know, the way it presents itself, you know everything that makes such a big difference and I think there's nothing like a, a really nice relaxed happy dog that will freestand you know for sort of creating an attractive picture and I think Christopher was probably quite like that from what I hear from folk you know so anyway let's move oh going the wrong way again so um movement and judging this is for you, Jim, because I know you've uh, posted something recently. So there were lots of questions about moving, movement. Can the panel discuss proper movement? Should a male with incorrections win over a dog that is not as fast as him? Judges choose a dog who was incorrectly made because they said my dog was lazy. Some seem to think that a golden should be flashy and speeding around the ring. Many think that a dog needs to be moved fast so a judge can see correct movement. And do you feel that there is an issue some judges making their final placements on a dog's profile without remembering how that dog moved? So, Jim, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'm not seeing the full screen. Um, I'm only seeing yourself, myself and Becky. Uh, but let's take the the last one first. Um, some judges making the final decisions on what was that? Not remembering how the dog moved. Dog moved, yeah, just uh, on their profile. Let's face it; they shouldn't be judging them, should they? Really, if you can't remember how the dog moved, and you're only going placing your dogs on how the dog looks. Um, yeah, I made a comment on Facebook uh, after the last time I, I judged dogs, but not only that, you know, I, I watch a lot of groups and um, it does seem that the all-rounders, the big all-rounders are, are looking for, you know, fast, flash.
think we've lost you, Jim. Died. Yeah. Oh, Jim. Shall we um, see if you can get your connection sorted out and maybe we could get Sandra to take over the theme? Can you see the question, Sandra? Yes, I can. Um, yeah. yeah. I um, actually love the speed of dog, uh, the pace that you guys in the UK show the dogs. I think it's a correct pace for the breed. In Australia, um, they like flashier dogs and they move them too fast. And many judges that have come over here have made that comment that we move our dogs too fast. We have our leads tied up around the neck and off we go. And I tend to agree with that. I love the lovely um, loose leads around their neck and the speed that they um, move like that. I've often said a golden retriever um, that moves as a golden retriever is a bit of a boring dog to watch move in a way because he just does it and he's happy to do it and the speed is correct and uh, compared to other breeds of gun dogs that, that go hell for leather. Um, but I, I think that um, movement should always be a consideration as well as um, the, the profile of the dog. And when a dog appeals to you, um, you think, oh, I really like this dog. Please move. Please move well. Please, you know. And yeah. sometimes, often, they don't. And you think, oh, no, what yeah. am I going to do now? I really like him. So um, it all goes together. And um, you're looking for a dog that um, that is pleasant to watch moving, that is smooth, happy, and goes at a nice golden retriever pace. Yeah. And I think often goldens that are moving well move very, a ground covering effortless movement. And actually, it looks a little bit lazy. It doesn't look as flashy, maybe, as some of the other breeds might look. Um, because that's how they are they're, they're as you say they're just easy um it's interesting yes. yeah they just do it they just do it and it looks easy and it's pleasant and it's smooth and smooth. it's happy and they've got that smiley face with those beautiful eyes and you think oh yes that's that's really nice and and at the end of the day, your your movement is actually confirmation in action, isn't it? You know, it's their anatomical structure on doing what it should do. And if a dog's nicely made, technically it should move nicely. And you know, I think some of the things that we see with the rolling and the and the slightly choppy movement that you get when dogs are, are, are over angulated, it does take away from breed specific movement. Yeah, yeah. Jose, anything to add about movement in the brain? Yeah, this is a, this is a very interesting topic. I think uh, goldens are not only movement, but also are movement. Yeah. So uh, it's one one more of the things you you must to 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 judge and to decide. Uh, but obviously, it's the most evident thing for the other people for the other. Uh, exhibitors and also for the people that is watching uh, uh, the breed in the ring and everything. Um, but I, it's, I think it's not possible to give um, an award to a dog that moves better than all, or, or in a more showy way than another one that is well made and well constructed. Uh, it's one of the points, but it's not uh, only that point. And for me, as you say, the, the the key point in movement is it uh, must be an effortless movement mm -hmm. an economical movement uh, that allows a, a dog to be uh, working a long long day in in the field and uh, they need to do that movement without any effort any apparent effort and must be very balanced very balanced in front and behind and uh, when you see that effortless movement is something that you easily can 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 see and enjoy and 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 award yeah yeah and it looks really lovely doesn't it yeah. it's just it's just uh, as Sandra and you say you know it's just wonderful to see a golden just gliding and and you know with that as you say the smiley eyes and the gentle slashing tail you know it's really it's it's a picture to behold isn't it 
And yeah. maybe it looks maybe kind looks sometimes kind of looks lazy for some people because it's it's moving like it's it's doing nothing very don't don't need to do any special thing to move well. It's not running. It's not being fast or doing efforts like a, I don't know a, a sighthound or something like that. It's yeah. just that easy yeah. movement that you can say, oh, this dog is <laughs> walking in the city or walking in the street or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, golden retrievers come under a category of dogs called endurance trotters. And I always think that we're absolutely so lucky that we're judged in a trotting gait because yeah. our dogs are just com confirmation is just absolutely meant for that. And um, as you say, you, you've you got that that wonderful, just easy, easy on the eye. One of the things when we've done the tea time chats before, I've asked often asked judges why in the UK do golden retrievers not do better in the group? And they've often said that it's because of that they that they they don't, you know, they tend to be lazy on the move. But I think in Spain you would have many more goldens doing better in the group than we do. Yeah, well, not not only in Spain, in the FCI uh, countries is very uh, common to see the goldens win the group. Um, of course, group in the FCI is not as big as the as Gando group in the UK. Yeah, it's divided in two different groups: the group seven with the uh, pointers and and setters, and group eight with retrievers, uh, water dogs, and spaniels. So it's it's easy to see a, a good golden winning groups, yes, and sometimes even best in shows. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's in, interesting. It's a it's something that I've conundrumed quite quite a lot over the years of why that is, you know. Um, yeah, but Becky, go on. Off I go. think people, some people, might confuse speed with drive. Yes. They are two entirely different things. You do not need to go at a million miles an hour to have decent rear drive and forward reach. When you run your dogs out of gait, as it were, it unbalances them. Their top line goes one way, their front goes another, and their back goes another. And all you see is frantically running legs around the ring, which is just totally alien to what the breed... It should be effortless movement. Yeah. Just, as you say, gliding easily around the ring. And when it, you see it, with a dog holding its top line, that you could put a tray of teacups on without disturbing them. Speed does not mean drive. And then, of course, you've got a dog with a wonky front, so their handlers will string them up. And when I see a dog strung up, I, my first thought is, all right, what am I going to expect here? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. because I'm cynical, of course, like that. Yeah. Do you find, Sandra, that that affects the movement? You were talking about them in Australia, stringing them up. Do you find when you've judged in the UK and Australia that you, you see a difference in the way the movement is because of that? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the movement in dogs is handler error and... Um, because the lead is too tight, the dog's trying to follow the handler. The speed of the handler is too fast, so he goes really fast and his legs will go everywhere. I'd like to see them all going around the ring loose with no lead to see yeah. how they'd really actually, because I think um, handler error, and it's nobody's fault we all do it because, I, you know, I, I'm not the greatest handler either. And, um, you know, we tend to the, – the dog is very – uh, aware of the leash and the handler's management of the leash. Yeah. And as soon as the leash changes around his neck, he's thinking, oh, well, something's going to happen here. What's happening? And what do you mean? What do you want me to do? Whereas if he, he was on a lovely loose lead, um, he'd be quite happy to just trot along beside you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think you're right, Becky, that it does it does change so much about the whole picture of the dog when you when you you know you see people and they pull up you know they're not terrier fronted yeah. at all and they're not and somehow you start to lose that nice smooth movement that you want from a golden i, I will often say to people right well i one when i judge i will rarely ask a dog for a triangle because either every single handler in the world does not understand what a triangle is or they deliberately do it wrong and um, so I go straight out and back and then all the way around on a loose lead. 
<laughs> because if there's anything wrong you haven't picked up, you soon will. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my father used to get demented years ago. There was a, a flat coat. He was very, very nice until he moved. And my father was so exasperated that it was in the days when they used to have those ghastly benches. If everybody in the middle got off, the one on the end would be prepared. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, those ones. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so he got a row. He got everyone to stand up. I think it was at Leicester City. And oh. he got a row of benches and he put them down between the ring ropes and said to the lady who was from Wales, I said, now take him up and down there. And it's still sidled from side to side. And he said, I give up. It must have been born like it. <laughs> yeah and i think with goldens you with the excessive angulation that we're seeing in some dogs that you 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 get this horrible rolling gait that is just so untypical of the breed it looks more like one of those one of is it sussex spaniels that move with a rolling gait something like that it is indeed and they should roll as 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 should the irish water spaniel but with the irish water the roll comes from behind the rib kit, behind the elbow because of the rib being right on the elbow all oh, right so okay. the sussex is the length of the body yeah yeah okay so um yeah really I'm the internet waste there so um Hopefully I'm back for good now. Right. <laughs> you went yeah. to check the rugby score, didn't you? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, I feel <laughs> sorry for um, <laughs> Sandra yeah. because I'm sure I was tonight. Uh, I was just going to say about the, the, the stringing up, uh, because in some European countries now, for instance, Germany, I mean, it's just it's a no-no. I mean, I was there last year and I listened to a, a briefing for... 50 minutes the first day and the same briefing on the second day, another 50 minutes. And the emphasis <laughs> primarily was in uh, don't string your dogs up, uh, otherwise you'll be penalised and you you have to have this uh, lead with a, a stopper on it. Yeah. So you, you can't do it. So I don't know if other countries will adopt this eventually or not. Mm. Hello. Yeah, it's um, it, it it is interesting. I mean, nowadays when I when I first started, we didn't have mobile phones that could take video footage. But nowadays, I think if you want to see how your dog's moving or see if you can alter your pace to to get your dog moving, to you can ask somebody to f film you, and that is such a wonderful sort of resource when you are training and and um, showing your dog. You know, it's a real big thing that a lot of exhibitors should be doing now because then you can find the right pace for your dog. Um, it It's not necessarily a quick pace. It's the right pace for your dog to get the best out of him, isn't it? Yeah, Sandra says that there's nothing nicer to see a golden just flowing uh, around the ring on a loose lead. It's just uh, it's the bee's knees. Yeah. But how often do you see it? Sorry, who was that? Oh, was it me? How often do you actually see it? Uh, less and less now. You know, you they use... labour round. I don't want to see a golden being moved at the speed of an American cocker, but I do want to see some animation, some indication that it could do the job it was actually bred for. Yeah, provided they've got good forward reach and good drive. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. A, as I said, that's... as I said when you were off air, people confuse speed with drive, and they're completely different. Yeah, sure. My Astra feels like it's going fast, but it isn't. <laughs> Not even vaguely fast enough. But you want the speed of a golden coming from its reach, don't you? You know, they should have that good, good reach in their stride, and that should give them that effortless movement. Anyway, let's go on to the next contentious topic, which is coat colour. And um, it was very interesting because somebody said um, judges are biased to the darker golden retrievers. And um, then somebody else said, we think that judges are biased towards the cream golden retrievers. Um, somebody else says, what about the white goldens? Somebody brought up a very interesting point, which was easy that the paler goldens are easier to groom and that you can fashion their coat into a, a different shape because their top coat and their undercoat are the same colour. 
Um, so you can sort of enhance or conceal certain features by using the coat in that way. So they felt that there was some distinct advantages um, for exhibitors showing pale goldens. Um, somebody asked, should goldens, uh, should over grooming in goldens be penalised because it's not actually typical of the breed? And um, somebody else asked, are coats now untypically thick and this makes a dog look heavy? So um, shall we do um, Becky first with this? Um, well, I was brought up with black dogs. Um, and I can assure you, yes, it is possible to trim a front into a black dog because I've done it many a time. But a decent judge, and I mean one that actually knows construction and how to feel in the right place and doesn't do all sorts. I mean, seriously, but no, I've watched some judges go over dogs and wondering what, where they thought what they were looking for actually existed. Um, I'm not colour biased at all. I want a correctly constructed, typical golden. Um, you can, if you, yeah. I can probably take the point that a white, a lighter golden is easier to trim in a shoulder or give the appearance of a shorter loin or more length of leg by taking out the feathering from underneath and whatever else. But any judge worth their salt who can see construction will spot that straight away. And I don't care whether it's a dark, middle, light golden or whatever. I will put try and put up the one, you know, that I can find nearest to breed type. Um, and I don't think there, sh there should be any, um, there should be any distinction. I mean, it, as long as they all come within the standard, like the ones in that picture. Yeah. I, I know some people are known. Um, I mean, when I used to select, you know, we used to select judges for United Retriever Club. I said, oh, well, if you get that one, they'll only put white. Or they only put that one, they'll only put dark. Mm. So you've got to put, but... But but, but it, when you are judging, you should judge within the standard, and that's absolutely. Oh, you know. um, so I, I I don't actually have any color preference at all. Oh. Um, and as I say, yes, people can try and trim in a front or whatever it is they do. Um, I mean, the flat coat standard used to say um, tidy, tidied, but not barbered. Sadly, that has gone out of the standard and they're being stripped with an inch of their lives, which totally takes away, you know, the shape of a flat coat. And I would imagine it would a golden as well. Mm. Um, yeah, by all means, thin out the neck, but don't don't thin it out to an extent that the head looks totally divorced or even, even if it was never married to the body. Um, mm. But as to colour preference, I have absolutely none. You know, if if I prefer a dark one, I prefer a dark one. If I prefer a light one, I prefer a light one. It's the best dog on the day for me. Yeah, absolutely. Jose, do you have problems with colour mm. prejudiced in Spain, or are you uh, well, a good mix? Or this is this is one of the one of the main topics always. Uh, I think if if uh, judge's decision depends on the colour of a golden retriever. Always that this color is in the in the standard into the standard is because it's not a good judge. And uh, also, I must say that it doesn't exist such a thing of white golden retrievers. White is a genetic color in some breeds, and it's not in the golden retrievers. And if someone takes uh, the paler one and put it on a snowy uh, yes. place we'll see that it's not white. Yeah, yeah. And about the grooming and re what they say that about reshade the dog and everything, well, uh, a golden is not a poodle. So if if a judge is fooled by the grooming of a dog and, and don't see if he has a good neck or good shoulders or everything, it's, I think it's because he's uh, blind yeah, <laughs> or, has, yeah. or has not hands to, to touch the dog. But... Um, but about the grooming, I think it is also is very. Uh, I'm very concerned about the fashion now to have the dogs with a totally, totally, totally flat coat. Yeah. And um, uh, for the to to do this or remove or even select dogs without the proper undercoat, yeah. and the undercoat is so 
so important in the breed that if if you don't have a good undercoat, you cannot you cannot have a good golden retriever because he's he's exposed to the danger of uh, of the weather or uh, uh, frozen water and everything. So uh, I think also over grooming must not be penalized, but must not be uh, awarded. Yeah. I, I I used to love that. Some of my older dogs used to have lovely waves going down their back like that. And one of them, my, my one that was very strongly yayo bred, used to have curly trousers. Now, obviously, probably to the extent that wasn't thing. But actually, I used to love that, you know. And um, a lot of exhibitors don't like an undercoat because it's hard work. It takes a long time to dry a dog and you can't quite get that smooth over groomed appearance, you know, when you have got good undercoat, you know, they, they you have finished when you think you have finished to dry. And you, then, try, you try and again. Again. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> don't, don't you think that people get a little ex existential about coat? I mean, at the end of the day, coat is cosmetic. It will grow. If it's got good shoulders, it will always have good shoulders. If it's got wonky shoulders, it will have them no matter how much stinging and trimming and God knows what else you do. I mean, I've given CCs to dogs not in their best coat because they were quite clearly the best constructed yeah. and our best type. I mean, you know, I just think always, oh, I've got to enter at the last minute because I don't know if my dog bitch is going to have enough coat or whatever. Mm. I mean, as long as the quality of coat is there and you can see the undercoat or feel the undercoat, then I, I do think people get a little bit, you know, is that the only thing people can judge on is a coat? One of the, well, it's the dressing, isn't it? And one of the fashions that have certainly crept into the UK is using these dry coats, which oh, they're really good. they put on, but they flatten the coat and it looks, it gives quite a, a sleeker kind of different appearance to the coat. You know, there's definitely changes the overall appearance um, with that. So to me, it's slightly not typical for the breed, but I, I'm with Jose that you want some nice, good undercoat for a, for a dog who has to work in Scotland. Yep. All your hard weather. Yeah, Jim's put, Jim's put his heating on, don't forget. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, you've got to think, uh, again, on the whole, and I would put a dog with lesser coat over an untypical golden or something with wonky shoulders or sickle hocks or yeah. over undulated hindquarters because that is a far, far bigger problem than a bit of lack of coat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Jim, have you anything to add about coat? Well, colour, um, as Jose commented on the... Uh, the white golds. I mean, if you have a white um, Samoyed and stand it beside uh, a very pale cream golden, you'll realise there's really no such thing as a as a white golden retriever. And there is actually a version of this picture with a Samoyed on one end. I did look for it, but couldn't find it. I was but, yeah. in the other one, in the other. Yeah, but yes, and you can clearly you can clearly see that the 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 the, the light cream golden has got, um, you know, is cream and not white. I I think that the lovely thing about a golden retriever when you see a good coat is that the the guard hairs actually look like gold. They sparkle. There's a sort of iridescence to them that. Um, you know, when you have got a good coat, and I always think, well, those are the threads of gold. That's that's how I kind of see it. Yeah. But then I'm a bit... But going back uh, a good number of years ago, I mean, there were judges who would never consider either a pale or a, or a golden retriever, you know. Take, for instance, I won't mention names, but one certain judge went to Scandinavia and... Um, said to the stewards, can I have all the pale ones on this side and all the ones with colour on this side? And I think <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Penny. <laughs> crazy. Somebody message me afterwards and tell me who it was. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I know. The, the trimming, for instance, yeah, it's, it's much easier with a, a cream and gold because it's so difficult uh, sometimes. Uh, and I wish some of the ones with the, with the darker uh, coats 
wouldn't try and take as much out of it and just, you know, leave a bit more uh, because some of them are, uh, it gives the appearance as if they've been shaved. Uh, no, they haven't. Well, they used to be shaved by some one exhibit in particular, <laughs> but it's it's a bit off putting. Uh, yeah. when they do it, the create, it creates lines, doesn't it, over the neck and yeah. shoulder? You get the kind of a V effect, which is a bit distracting, I think, um, when they've taken the, the top coat out. Yeah, yeah. It and I, still, I still think that there's, there's modern day judges who do judge um, basically to colour. Not yeah. so much not so much as way back, but uh, there's still quite a few who judge to colour. Yeah. But if, if you know that in advance, you don't enter. That's right. You I feel sorry for the novice people who just basically enter every show and then they come down to earth with a bang. <clears throat> yeah. I bet they get the thing when they're stood in the ring and they look round and they see that they're the wrong colour, that they, they think, oh, never oh, mind. I, I always keep a notebook. I kind of uh, have a good good running tot of of people that have particular preferences yeah Sandra anything to add about colour in Australia yeah. um, personally I don't have any preference at all about colour I don't care what colour they are and um, decades ago or not um, yeah decades ago now when creams first started appearing there was a lot of bias about the dog and um, you know the old saying but these are golden retriever he should be gold which drives me mad and uh, but now they nowadays there's a lot more of them around. Um, they're more accepted. I find the all breeds type style of judges tend to like the gold dogs um, a little bit more than the cream dogs. But there's a lot of dogs being exhibited now that are pale. Um, and and I'd say that uh, maybe seventy percent accepted overall. And they have to be good dogs as well. So construction, as far as trimming goes, we uh, they trip, we trim our dogs, but they shouldn't be trimmed to hide any of their outline. That should enhance the outline. And really, judges feel with their hands. And even if you try to put a front on a dog, um, your hands, if they trim the neck right down and leave the ruff at the front, my, my eyes go straight to the ruff and my hands go there too to see what's under it. A lot of the time, there's nothing. So yeah. they will be doing themselves a disservice by accentuating a front that isn't there. Just leave the dog, you know, yeah. as natural as possible and tidy. Yeah. And correct is very important. Um, it it, it is easy, problem. though, for people to be fooled. I mean, many, many years ago now, I went to an English setter JDP and uh, five dogs wheeled in in the afternoon. And I thought, well, I'd like to look at the first one. And then when it moved, it had no length of stride at all. I thought, well, something, you know, have a look at that front. And when I got up close to the dog, they'd scissored a bloody front in. Mm. But it was so easy. As soon as it took two steps, you just knew there was something yeah. not right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you as a judge, your whole, you're informed by so many things, aren't you? you, you you're observing, you're feeling, you're watching the kinetic action. You, you know, anybody that kind of just goes off a profile and forgets about everything else is not a good judge. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, going back to the movement thing, you watch someone, I mean, I watch Goldens quite often, and you'll see a judge, um, more often or not, it's a, uh, a single-breed judge who I don't necessarily know who it is, and they'll shortlist from a class of whatever size, and then they'll move them again. And it's obvious that one is the best mover in the class and it gets placed fifth. And you think, what is the point of them moving it again, them all again, and then not to put up the best mover? Jim, can I ask you why you think Goldens don't do better in the group in the UK? Because I think um, two things, um, colour, uh, if it's pale, a lot of your all-rounders would really not consider it. And the other thing is the, they're not maybe flashy or move fast enough. That, yeah. That's the two reasons, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that's... Do you not agree? Do you not agree on that? Yeah, I do, definitely. I, I agree. Um, 
I'm I'm not sure necessarily about the colour, but certainly when I've asked, you know, most of the prominent all rounders in in that I've had a chat with about this, they've said that it's very much around the movement and the fact that they're not as um, often not in good hard condition as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a very good point. Yeah. When you see when you see in the UK sometimes uh, more times than a golden retriever winning uh, Sussex spaniels or clambers, so movement cannot be the reason. Yeah. Oh, I've judged the group in the UK eight times now, and pretty much every show where I've judged, and there has been two golden retriever judges, I've been trailed down to the far end of the showground to referee. And I'm confronted by two dogs that I wouldn't even consider for a CC because they've been short on the leg and long in the back. And that's what would eliminate it for me. I, would, I don't, I mean, the only golden I ever shortlisted in a group was actually a pale gold, but he moved with drive, mm. not flying around the ring, just a good, steady driving movement. Mm. But I'm just thinking, you know, what are breed judges seeing? Why don't they ever agree? And why am I confronted with dogs that are short on the leg, long in the back, and have absolutely no muscle tone whatsoever? That's why I wouldn't consider them. Yeah. So you're you're adding the muscle tone in as well, well which is what a lot of Do you of not us... think a dog, a gun dog especially, should be well muscled up? I mean, they are meant to do a day's work in the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no in the UK, the, the, the muscle is very much lacking, whereas some countries, uh, they are rock, rock hard, you know. For instance, and in Russia, oh, they yeah, told to yeah, just yeah. so rock hard. I mean, quite frankly, shit. some of them are park and pavement dogs. Mm. And I wonder if they've actually been on a decent walk in all their lives. Sandra, do you do your Goldens in Australia do well in the group? Uh, yes, not as well as they used to do years ago, but um, they're certainly competitive in the group and um, they're awarded um, accordingly. So um, I, I, I suppose uh, they're probably a, a bit more acceptable um, to the all-rounders than um, uh, many of the ones that might be overseas. So, But they do do well in the group. A lot of them do, yeah. Yeah, okay, interesting. So let's move on. So this kind of, we've, we've covered quite a lot of this about condition and weight and obviously, um, you know, this is goes back to things like the condition as well as confirmation. So what is their opinion on heavy conditioning of the dogs? So this is about... Um, using things like treadmills and um, e ongoing exercise, things like balance boards and things to build up condition. And then the other part of this question, strong and heavy dogs are doing well in the show ring. This is not typical of a working dog and they couldn't do a day's work while most dogs not meet the old weight in the standard. How should the weight be considered when judging? And just to put this into context, there are three dogs on the screen here. The 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 bottom one is Norembri Campfire, who was one of the very early um, influential stud dogs. And then the the middle one's a dog from the nineties, and the top one's a dog from the twenty twenties. And um, all of these dogs obviously did a lot of winning in their own time. But you can see that that. Um, the, the actual overall weight of the dog was much less in the early days. So, um, Sandra, do you want to start? Oh, Jim, you can start because you 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 faded out when you had your first start, didn't you? I don't I, I don't think there's a problem with weight in the UK, um, unless the the dog is so short in the leg and so deep in body. I don't see a problem. No. That's it. Good, good, good. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a problem in other countries either. No, I mean, I like, I like substance. The dog has got to have substance, no fat, etc., and it has to be well muscled. But I keep going back to that doesn't happen very much in the UK when you're going to feel a, a dog's hindquarters. It's soft, 
yeah, yeah. So people have to learn to put some work in. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about the treadmill, etc. I know people who who use them and the, the swear by them, and they they consider that the dog likes it. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sandra. Can you, can, oh, sorry. Um, I I don't believe treadmills and um, all that sort of stuff. The best exercise is natural exercise and walk the dogs and let them run free and swim and build up their condition naturally. Um, and so, and as far as the weight goes, some some are getting a little heavy and a bit clumbersome and... Um, overboned uh i feel taking the weight out of the standard was a little detrimental because it was a bit of guideline towards an athletic dog um and without it there they have um got a lot heavier than what they were i don't want them seeing being like the dog at the bottom there but mm. some of them um you know some puppies can be 37 kilos at nine months of age um and some dogs are, would have to be over forty kilos. Yeah, um, so yeah easily. Getting, and you you wonder why or how they could possibly work all day having all that body to move around. So yeah, I'd yeah. like. Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah, and I think from the point of view of na exercising them naturally, it's so good for their mental well being. You know, if they can run around uphill, down dale on the beach, you know, doing different things. I think um, that's really important to mentally condition them as well as physically. Yeah, Joseph. Fred, sorry. Fred sorry. Over, I think it's, oh, sorry, sorry. Their front, um, a dog that's um, on a treadmill all the time can build up its front and not build up its body, um, all of its body at the, uh, evenly. Yeah, yeah, to get loaded on the shoulder, probably. Yeah, yeah. I've not used one, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I have exactly the same opinion. I think uh, there are no better way to have a dog in good condition than uh, walk, uh, run, and swim, and uh, do it freely and playing and going to the field, and that's it. Uh, all the other things can be can be useful depending on where you live and uh, if you can or not or cannot exercise the dogs normally but uh, I don't like that that type of forced exercise because also they can they can promote some uh, wrong wrong things in, in in the dogs even problems even if you are if you are doing a, an exercise with a continuous movement that is forced to the dog maybe, they start to to do things differently to adapt to that movement and maybe finally you have not a, the best uh, the best condition or the best movement in the dog yeah. uh, about the heavy dogs i think sometimes we have heavy dogs in the ring but not because they are fat but because they are big or has uh, too much bone or too much substance and uh, but a fat dog normally you see easily and it's out of the ring or out of the winners because uh, it's totally out of condition but yes we have some dogs that are not only uh, heavy but also some i think some dogs especially some males are very big today yeah yeah i think so and there's a point it's almost like that that, that it, i don't necessarily mean this completely like the bmi for dogs mm. you know, if they're an athlete a work you know supposed to be a working dog retrieving there's a point where the weight is not beneficial for that function for their fit to function bit is is it and um being overboned and and overly big in the head you know if you think the head is adding considerable weight to the to the to the balance of the dog you know that that I think is not good yeah yeah interesting thank you thank Penny, you did you photoshop that picture of the top dog because I'm sorry but this is where moderate has to come in it is so overdone I actually wondered I, I I've been cleaning my screen because I thought you'd thrown in a clumber spaniel with this, oh, sorry, is, this, is, this is an outline of a pitch of a photograph. But um, it's so heavy. 
you yeah. it couldn't work if i took that picking up i'd be worrying all day it was going to collapse and i was somehow i was going to have to get it back to a vehicle <laughs> sorry yeah. but no 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 it is overdone in head it is jowly in neck it is short in leg it is over angulated in fact i'm not even sure it's back legs are in the same postcode yeah. and it's completely overdone you, and then look at the middle picture and it's moderate do you know what i mean yeah yeah and, yeah, a dog that's fat will roll around like a ship in distress. But that is just so overdone. Yeah. And no, but no, not and, and, and has lost that fit for function, hasn't have it, it is not even vaguely fit for function. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah. I think when I, I tell you what, it would use use it as one of those things you put draft excluders, it'd do a cracking job. <laughs> With the um with when we're training judges, I think we very much have to look about training a, around that function, fit for function, and training around. Well, actually, we're a ret retriever, and then the this is the sort of dressing on the cake, if you like, with the standards. Um, I think we need to almost par things back a, a a step to to actually get people to 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 focus on the fact that they are still supposed to be able to work. And, um, you know, a dog that is too heavy will definitely struggle, you know. And can you imagine climbing over the gorse with legs like that? You'd be, or the heather. It's so hard to walk over those heather moors, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't even get on the gorse, let alone across it. I it. No, I know. Which, which dog is the one in the middle, Penny? It's one of mine. Yes, yes, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Rory. It was Rory. Very, very nice. Maybe, very maybe nice. you don't. Maybe you don't remember uh, a young couple from Spain in 1993 at Crafts trying to convince you to sell Rollo. Oh. <laughs> was me. Was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rollo. Yeah, Rollo. Yeah. And you say no, 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 no. It's not for sale. <laughs> No, definitely not for sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'll fancy that. Yeah, yeah. No, that that was that was Rory. I I did quite well with him, but he was a um, he was uh, Rollo and Ramsey were much more extrovert. You know, they had that kind of Saxon yeah. way about them, whereas he, he wasn't quite as confident. But I always love his outline. I think you've got balance and um you know reasonable length of leg in relation to depth of body so it's a, a picture that I, i've kind of butchered sometimes to do a bit of training around you know it's been been um i think the biggest problem well for me is the legs seem to be getting shorter and the body seem to be getting longer yeah, yeah. and I, and for functionality in a in an endurance dog it should be roughly the body should be roughly 50% of the, the overall depth. So if you look at the height, you want 50% body and then the rest leg, and then you've got nice, easy um, you see, ride. Balance yeah. comes from lots of different angles. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you take a large Munsterlander, for example. They are supposed to be square, but they've also got to be square within the square. So you could have a square outline, but you've still got to have a length of rib and a short loin. Do you see what I mean? So it might be the right height and length from the outside, but you've got to look at the internal diagnostics as well. So yeah. it may have the right length of leg. It may have, you know, be equal from wither to elbow to elbow to foot. But then if it's got a short rib and a long loin, it's going to be equally as useless. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll shut up now. Actually. Um, so um I think we've got a little bit of time just to go through the the sort of the rest of the random questions that came through. So there were a couple of questions about judges not judging actually for the breed, you know, having the best male and the best bitch. The judge told me he would choose the best bitch, not because she was better than the male, but because he was the best um be but because he was the best, but because he thought that the bitch would do better in the main ring. Um, so what are your 
thoughts about that, Jose, about when you choose your best of breed? Are you choosing that dog for the group or are you choosing no. it as the best example? No, you must choose always the best, the best in the breed. I'm not thinking about the main ring because you don't know what the what the judge will do in the main ring. So it's so it's so I think is it, this is one of the uh, typical excuses we have in the uh, judges excuses catalog. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, but it's not it's not true when because you never know what will happen in in the main ring. So I think you must send to the main ring always the one that you feel is the best one. Yeah. Um, because if if you don't do that, maybe when the dog or the beast go into the main ring, you will think about the, the one that you haven't... Haven't put forward. Have, yeah. <laughs> no. well, I would say, as a group judge, I'm sure Jim would, you, Jose, anybody... As a group judge, you are at the mercy of the breed judge who may or may not send through the best exhibit on the day. And yes. you think, is it because they don't know or are they playing some political game? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it is it is difficult, isn't it? Any, uh, Sandra, any comments about that? Um, no, I absolutely don't care whether the general specials judge likes my dog or not that I've put through. I try to send through a, 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 a good dog and um, it's my opinion and it was my choice on the day. And here in Australia, we, we don't have a lot of um, breed judges like you do in England where you all the breed judges do the breed and then go through to the group judge. Um, usually the group judge does the whole group right from the start and also group specials and sends the dog through to the general specials judge. So I always try and send through a... a a quality dog and uh, hope that he likes it. If he doesn't, well, I don't really, doesn't worry to worry me. No, 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 it wouldn't worry me, Jim. Would it, would it worry you, Jim? What the group judge? Well, I, must, I must be honest. In the past, uh, when I'm judging uh, both sexes, um, I have considered what would be the best uh, for the group ring. But, you know, I've learned through the years that really that's not the way to go about it. So, I mean, I have made mistakes and I think everyone has made mistakes and I think I still make mistakes, but yeah. this, judging, this judging idea is um, you're learning something every time you judge. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, think that's I, the big... I totally endorse what Jim said. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've often driven home from appointments and I thought, mm, yeah, I wonder if I should have given that the reserve CC or, you know, should have had the CC winner or the reserve CC winner. Yeah, yeah. Another way around. Or I think in a group it's re group. really important to reflect on what you've done because that's how you learn. Um, and quite often I've done things and then later on I thought, well, you know, actually with this and with that, I probably should have done it differently and then next time I will. You know, you, you, it prepares you, doesn't it, for the next time you meet a similar kind of challenge. And it's not easy always, is it, judging? You know, you, you're... We have, we have seconds to make up our minds, especially in a group ring. You yeah. are expected to judge that gundog group in under an hour. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, a, a, you know, well, 31 breeds plus an import register, 32 breeds in an hour. And... Yeah. You 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 know one of each, and your mind is whirring the whole time. I mean, my mind, you know, as soon as they start to come in, my mind starts whirring. Do I like that? Do I like that? The first walk round, you can see, you know, mm. what you might, you know, look at again, or something might look good on the stack, and then when it moves, it all goes horribly wrong. Um, dogs that maybe don't stand out on the first walk round, on going over them. You know, you've got seconds to make up your mind. Yeah, yeah. I know it takes a lot of experience, I think, to do it fluently. Not that I've ever done it, but never mind. The the, the last part of this question is struggling with the different opinions on type. And then they said American versus UK. I think really for, for the purpose of this talk, our standards are all fairly UK based. Um, 
am I right, Jose? You, you, your, you, your country, your FCI uses yeah. the UK standard yeah, for the UK standard, UK type, yes. Yeah, and but, UK. well, but uh, some FCI countries, especially uh, countries in South America and Asia, most of the Goldens there are yeah. even being FCI countries. Uh, the Goldens are from American lines and American type. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they are. I, I and I I've been to a couple of countries where you have maybe a mixture of an American and, and UK, you know, and European type, and it it is quite interesting because they are different in their confirmation. And I think what's important is is that you judge to the standard of the country that you're judging in. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think personally, I think that's how I would handle that part of the question. Is is Am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But if, um, but anyway, if if you're judging in in South America, the standard is the UK standard, uh, but the dogs are not. <laughs> they're, they're American, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's challenging. It's it's difficult. It's difficult to have to make decisions with if you are judging with with uh, the UK standard in your mind, uh, judging. American type dogs and trying to find the ones that fit better with the with with the UK standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a bit tricky. You, do you have a few American dogs in Australia, Sandra? Um, we do have a few uh, American style dogs. Yes, um, they have done quite well under under some judges, and we do use the UK breed standard. So. Um, it, it still applies to them, even though they might be American style. Yeah. Um, getting back to the Asian, a lot of Asian dogs, and I've judged in a few countries, um, the FCI standard, which they go for, a lot of the dogs just don't match that at all. Sorry, but they don't. Yeah. And um, they're, they're not even really American style. Um, they're their own style. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure whether how they started off or the type of dogs that they got sent, but um, they're, they're different to the American dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's the American style, and amongst the American style in America, there are some nice dogs that don't necessarily have to be a pure American style. You can get a nice balance. Mm -hmm. um, when I judged there, I was quite happy with my best of breed witness, my challenge, and they could win here in Australia and possibly, you know, you you guys probably would, would think the same. They weren't um, classic American style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you, guys. So I, I kept this one in because I think it's a really important one and this is kind of like our last point of discussion. Everybody can sigh a sigh of relief because I think you know probably getting tired now apart from Sandra who's probably waking up um, I'm ready for breakfast <laughs> judges often choose showy impulsive attitude instead of the calm kindly friendly and confident temperament in the breed standard if judges are not selecting breed typical temperament are we in danger of changing the temperament in the breed and then somebody else said the breeder, owner and handler with the good dogs are often overlooked. And I think that might be that they're sort of maybe a little bit more docile. Um, I don't know, but um, let's do this one and see see what we do. Jim. Well, I think one of our, my uh, personal concerns for the whole breed is, uh, is this confidence uh, aspect and temperament. And um, I've seen quite a lot of um, very dodgy um, confidence uh, in Goldens in a few countries uh, even this year, and it really concerns me. I, I haven't seen much evidence in the UK, but um, it's, it's, I don't know where these dogs are coming from, whether it's, it's COVID puppies or, or not, but uh, it really concerns me. Another thing that concerns me is that you know, we haven't discussed anything on tails tonight, and I think tails are <laughs> tail carriage. So, uh, tail carriage, yeah. There's so many uh, 
<clears throat> with uh, high tail sets. But one thing that it's never discussed, and I don't think a lot of the newer judges um, seem to realise it. But I mean, the breed standard says that the the tail um, should not have a, a curl at the tip, and I see so many, 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 and it's totally distracting for me. The tail yeah. should just lie loose, and um, instead of that, it's turning up at the tip, and it's very off-putting for me. I know I'm on a different subject now completely. No, it's all right. Do you think that the, <clears throat> that the high tail carriage is to do with the tail set, or do you think it's to do with the temperament, you know? Is it is it a normal set on the tail, or is it coming well, off high off the back? Yeah, I think it's more the set. Uh, okay, there'll be a bit of temperament, and with dogs in particular, you know, uh, I'm the boss in this ring. But uh, no, I think it's the set. But um, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> can we discuss this? Uh, what I call hoop tail. Yeah. I hate it, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure I know where it's coming from, and it's been around for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. It, it and it's you actually an enthusiastic thing. It's actually the one of the few things that are actually stated in the standard, isn't it? Yeah. About yeah. the hook tail not being not being right. The, the curl at the tip. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I know, and I've not noticed that, Jim. Oh. Where have you been? <laughs> where, where have I been? <laughs> I've not been out. <laughs> I've not been out. I mean, yeah. <laughs> my my COVID seems to have continued. I'm stuck here doing house renovations. So, um, I mean, I've been out and judged the Golden Retriever Club, but I did bitches, you know. And um, by and large, the tail carriage was fairly okay in them. But have you seen high tail carriage in the bitches as well as the dogs? No, not not so much. Not no. so much, no. I, I think we did go through an awful phase, and I think a bit like you, I, I, I can tell there was a couple of stud dogs that were producing, um, you know, a high carriage of tail. But I, I haven't, I know what exactly what you mean by this hook tail, but I, I, I because I've not been out really since much since before COVID, I haven't yeah. actually seen it. It's been it's been around for a long time. I mean, I, I just I notice it all the time, and mm. it's very. I notice it more uh, when I'm standing at ringside than when I'm judging for some reason. No, uh, Jim, Jim is right. I've noticed it as well. It wasn't so prevalent when I judged, but I mean, I've watched classes since, and there's it's a set. It's a set from the pin bones to the root of tail. There should be a very slight slope. But if they're flat in croup, as in a terrier, their tail will naturally come up. Yeah. So I, it, it's definitely the set. And also, if, if the croup is flat, the rest of the hindquarters is going to be wrong because they're not going to follow in a natural line from down to the set. And then, yeah. The yeah, angulation. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's the whole rear assembly then. The whole rear it? assembly will be wrong <laughs> if the croup is flat. But, I mean, I what I find more worrying having watched both single breed judges and some all-rounders, is the political judging. I mm. mean, quite frankly, and it's not just in Goldens. It's across probably all breeds. It's absolutely bloody shameful. Mm. Ticket swapping, looking at what won last week because they haven't got the balls to put up what they actually know is right. It mm. is disgraceful. People are paying for your opinion. Give them their money's worth, for God's sake. We all make mistakes. Every judge in the world makes mistakes. Mm. I think but one an way... honest mistake will be forgiven. Yeah. Blatant, facey political judging is what is killing this hobby on its feet. Absolutely, absolutely. It's um, we you see the. Yeah, but what's the point of even dragging your? a bed in the morning if you know where the CC is going to go. Yeah. Well, there's no point, is there? I wouldn't have entered if I knew that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you want to be I judged on a level playing field. Yeah. Every exhibitor has paid the same money. They all deserve the same chance. And some of the judging I have seen, quite frankly, is shocking. Yeah. So, um, Jose, let's go back to tail carriage. Do you see much high tail carriage in... Yeah, yeah, 
Yes, yeah. especially mo most in in males than than females. So sometimes I, I'm agree that many times it's because of the set, but also sometimes, especially in the younger classes, uh, can be a temperamental thing. Yeah. But going back to this um, about the breed uh, a specific temperament, I don't understand very well what they mean as a showy, inclusive attitude. I'm most worried nowadays uh, with the dogs that has a uh, shy temperament, uh, very, look very uh, insecure. It's yeah. not easy to touch them even or see the, the bite and everything. And even sometimes I, I've just some goldens that when you are touching the rib case, you can feel they are Mm, I don't know what it's saying in English, but doing... Uh, oh, rumbling. Yeah, rumbling. Rumbling. Yes. yeah, yeah, rumbling. Then, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, very, that's, that's very bad for me because I think the temperament is, the, is the, one of the key points of the breed. It's one of the viewers we, we must to protect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think confidence yeah. is really yeah. paramount, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's frightening, actually. Yeah. Uh, so as he said, you know, <laughs> you sometimes just look in their eye and you're very, very careful. You it's, uh, suspect what's going to come. And all of a sudden it's round and uh, I'd like to have a wee go. Now, it's, uh, this is something that's been creeping in maybe for five, six years, yeah. which is really form uh, sh shouldn't be. And, and getting a hold of them to examine them and they're, they're turning around. And OK, it might be a novice handler, but at the same time, they are shy. Yeah. Kennel shy, perhaps, or just not socialised or breeding. Yeah, I, I'm more inclined these days to be very hard on temperament. I, I you know, if well, yeah, I'm yeah. judging FCI, I, you know, and I would ask people to leave now. And yeah. I withheld when I was judging another breed um, because I was in limit and couldn't examine the dogs. And I just felt that was, you know, that was not OK at that level. It wasn't a puppy that I couldn't look at. It was an adult dog. So I, I'm, my opinion of it is, is to be much harder now. You know, it's it's just not acceptable with a dog that should be kind, friendly and confident. You know, it's it's just not part of a golden retriever makeup to be like that. And as a judge, you shouldn't be nervous about going over them. But I know I've been. I changed my judging um, manner after I was bit on the face by a, a dog that shot up here when I bent over just to, to put my hands on the fore chest and it shot up between my thing. Now I turn around and go that way because I think if it wants to bite my very big fat bottom, that it can do that. It's not biting my face. But, uh, yeah, it's it's bad. So in the UK, Penny? Was that the UK? No, no, it was actually in a Scandinavian country, yeah. Yeah, and I, I and I said uh, you you have to leave. Uh, you know, I ousted them out of the ring. You know, and actually, when I withheld because of nervousness, I did actually offer the exhibitor, "Would you like to withdraw?" I did say that to them, um, and they declined my offer. So I just withheld because I just felt it was um, you know inappropriate. You know, so. But well, it's got something to do with the mixed pedigrees, eh? Pedigrees are just, it's a jumble now, isn't it? It's, um, does anyone study pedigrees No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Not in the same way that we would plan over no. generations of generations. And, you know, it, it's just such a hodgepodge, isn't it? And I think people go to dogs that win which is why this is so important to discuss, you know, the finer points of the breed and try and get trainee judges to really think about what they're doing. Um, because the influence of the dogs that we're talking about that are winning, it, 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 it's, it's catastrophic for a breed if we're picking up predominant faults and the faults that we've talked about, you know, the, the, lack, the lack of confidence, the nervousness, the carrying the tails, 
like a flagpole, you know, those are changing the whole ethos of a breed. Um, and I, I think a bit what you were saying, Jim, about hooked tails. When I see a fault becoming more predominant in a breed, I actually start to fault judge because I get rid of that fault. And I wouldn't fault, I wouldn't normally ever fault judge, but if a fault, if there's something that has become so predominant, you have to make a statement that that's not acceptable. And as right. a judge, that's the only way you can do it. I'm not having that. Penny, this is what I said earlier. When every time you award a CC to a dog or bitch, you are endorsing it as a breeding prospect. Right. And a novice exhibitor can easily be lured into using the top winning dog that year because it's won 40 tickets they think it's correct no not necessarily it might be a very very good specimen and deserve its 40 tickets or you could have 40 judges led down some blind alley well just just follow my leader judging because people are influenced or there's political things behind it becky you know where somebody is influential and they've got a dog that is you know it's not inconceivable that they would get 40 tickets. And one of the big troubles now with the UK, where we're kind of a little bit more opened up to Europe, is people will go and import semen or go and use foreign dogs when actually they know very little about the back pedigree. And um, that's one of the things I think where you're seeing things coming through that you think oh well where's that come from mm. I mean I was very very fortunate you know and my mother and father were in the breed obviously long before I came along so we'd drag out we used to have a whole file of pedigrees and I remember saying to mum one day I'd like to use that dog and she said, did you ever see its grandfather she said we're not even going near that bloody dog mm. she said read on <laughs> and I said what was wrong with it and she said, well, what was right with it, dear? Yeah. It's starting with its bucket-like head. Yeah. And but but it can be worse than that, Becky. We're not just having confirmation faults if you're talking about things like nervousness. Oh, absolutely. We had I mean... a very well used champion dog that produced fear aggression in the breed. Hmm. And that you could see that in its children, Jim, couldn't you? You know, you could see that coming out when you look back through the pedigrees or if you were judging the, the dogs on from on from that dog, you, you just absolutely knew, know where that trait came from. Because see, what yeah. would surprise you is the field trialers really look at pedigrees. I remember, I can't remember, Dad had judged, I think it was some AV or Labrador trial up north and I went with him. And there was a group of them all sitting around discussing what a certain person, I can't even remember who it was, should use. And he was thinking about a dog and some, someone said, well, I would, but I'm put off by it because every time you send it out, it goes out flat out and then it spins a couple of times before it gets to the bird. And its progeny is doing the same. Mm -hmm. you oh, know, I don't think it's very... just the shape people that should study pedigrees. The field trial is not will as well and if a dog has got a prevalent fault they won't touch it yeah but there again you know people will use their friend's dog because it's down the road or it's because it's their friend and um, because it's, I mean, it's, yeah, we used yeah. to have a wonderful dog in the breed who you know i would have used had i you know what had i been having a litter at that time but because the owner of the dog wasn't popular because she was like me rather outspoken sadly she's no longer with us so people didn't use the dog, and they should have done. More people should have used that dog because the breed, the flat coats, would be in a far better state today if they had. Yeah, yeah. So tails in Australia, Sandra. I don't think did you did you have any issues with the hooked tails? Very few. There aren't a lot of hooked tails. Um, very few dogs. No. Um, You'll be dealing with quite a different gene pool, won't you, from us? So you, I bet you um, see some different fault traits. That's not so now with, with um, the semen and the use of semen and importing dogs and all that. We're, we've very got a lot of the overseas dogs in our pedigrees now. Um, as far as um, temperament goes, I agree with you all. It's absolutely 
the most important thing. And I feel sorry for the dogs in the ring who are timid and don't have confidence. They don't understand where they are. And and I think, you poor little thing, you know, what what's happening? And then they go and breed on from these dogs and these poor little things are sold to pet homes and they're poor little frightened dogs that don't have a good life. And um, as a pet, the same with the aggressive dogs and the over-the-top temperament and over-the-top temperament might be fantastic in a breed but for the show ring but not for the home and the house where they're renowned to be wonderful pets and it just creates problems and uh, I, I, they're all human made and I feel sorry for the dogs who are doing their best to live their life in their homes but find it very hard because they're made the way they are the um, over the top temperament hard to manage timid um, scared um, and as far as tail courage goes, we seem to have more of a problem of the lower tail courage that they can't have trouble um, picking their tail up. Maybe they're a bit rumpy or something. I'm not too sure, but um, that seems to be creeping in and it can go with an over-exaggerated hindquarter. So it's probably all connected. Yeah. Um, and yeah. as well, of course, is an important issue, but um no temperament, um, and is... often, often those dogs that you're talking about that are living very frightened, nervous lives in pet homes are often dogs that are euthanized early because you know they bite or they nip and or they can't can't cope yeah. with it anymore. And obviously, you know the the difficult place in a rescue, you know, situation. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's it's humans' fault. Yeah, for, for being um, more careful and breeding the correct temperament. And uh, you know, it's getting quite obvious. I'm very harsh on it now. And um, if I have a timid dog, sometimes we don't have a lot of entries in the breed. Um, and if it's a timid dog, it doesn't get a challenge now, and that's it. Yeah. You know, I just I, I I I see a lot of it, and I think it's a problem. In the and breed you, over, and you would withhold from that. You, you would withhold. You would withhold your well, breed hallmark. And the most important thing in our breed is the temperament, um, and they have to be able to do the job they're bred for. They have to live with their families, and um, and be easy to train. An over the top dog is hard dog to train. They should be biddable, and they should want to please you and want to do what you want them to do. Not do their own things and pull you all over the place and even trying to train them is very hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this is something we've got to take on board, that for every litter we breed, and I haven't bred many, I've only bred when we wanted to keep one ourselves, but if in a litter of, say, eight, two might reach the show ring. The other six have been sold into families. You can't sell dogs with dodgy temperaments into families. I mean... You've got dog people and people who own dogs. There is a vast, vast difference. Yeah. And you could sell a puppy with a dodgy temperament into a home and someone might, you know, be out exercising, especially with a golden retriever where there's plenty of them, and say, oh, would she like to have puppies? Mm -hmm. And then they just let it have a litter of puppies and the problem compounds itself and compounds and compounds. Becky, they also say, I'd like a litter to calm them down. Oh, God, yes. I mean, my mother is My mother has been sec litter secretary for the Flatcade Retriever Society for more years than I can remember. And she gets these complete... And I'm not even going to say the word. Ring her. I mean, people that shouldn't have even been born. And say, oh, I've got a golden, I've got a, a lovely dog, and he wants a wife. Yeah. I mean, seriously, some of the conversations we'd make a. Uh, if I, <laughs> I used to be well, I'm still terribly naughty, but if I picked up the phone, I'd put it on the speaker, and she'd never realised. And my father and I would be in the other room, absolutely falling off the sofa, laughing, uh, trying to explain to these complete novices, very nice people that just breeding a litter from your bitch or wanting a, a wife for the doggy oh, so that he could be a daddy really wasn't the right way to go about things. I mean, it was hysterical. I know. So on that note, what I would like all of our lovely international panel to do is just give a, 
a, a sentence or two of advice to any aspiring judges or, you know, um, people that are thinking about starting to judge, just what a, a simple piece of advice. And Jim, you can start. Um, I don't think the, the Kennel Club mentoring uh, observation system is, is a great thing. I would rather prefer that uh, we get student judges in um, in the ring with, uh, with the judge. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, mentoring can occur in the ring, but um, the trainee judging system in Sweden and Scandinavia is really beneficial, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, Sandra? What advice would you give? Um, judges to judge remembering the reason, the the reason and function of the dog, and particularly pay attention to temperament, um, and um, breed hallmarks. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Well, <clears throat> I think. Um... Nowadays, the, the, the new school is different with uh, breeders, but if you as breeder did as uh, as we did, if you look for a mentor, for someone that helped you uh, on the way to be a good, a good breeder, do the same to be a good judge. Look for someone that is a, is a judge and has a good experience and uh, you have uh, confidence on, on his or her uh, knowledge about the breed and also be humble all the time every time you are into the ring be humble because uh, also you will learn from every exhibitor and every dog you have under you absolutely and it's a privilege isn't it to be standing there and, and for people to come and ask your opinion that's really sound advice and my little bit of advice, I'm going to come to Becky next, but that was actually have a good men. A good mentor can be helpful, but having a great mentor can change your life. And that's really what you're saying, isn't it? Find that person that really um, makes that difference to you because it alters the whole way that you think and the way that you can see things when somebody is actually um, not just drawing the best out of you, but but opening that mental perspective, I think, is is very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Becky. Firstly, I would say, it. as a judge, you will make mistakes. I've yeah. made some conquests in my time, I can promise you that. But you learn from it. Yeah. Secondly, you learn from it. Yeah. <clears throat> people are paying for your opinion, not the judge last week or next week. Learn the breed, learn correct breed type and judge honestly, not on who you're going to get your next ticket from or your next judging appointment from, because you'll soon be found out and your entries will drop like a bloody stone. I can promise you. Yeah. Yeah. And as well, someone that doesn't show anymore, I've got nothing to trade, nothing to gain. Get in that ring and give people value for money and an honest opinion. Yeah. Very well said, Becky. And I think... It's absolutely a massive problem in the UK at the moment. And one of the things why people aren't investing in in showing their dogs, you know, is is because they don't feel that they're getting value for money, which is is a tragedy. Anyway, Seriously, I would I rather get a honest than... second than a wonky CC. Yeah, yeah. Sandra, were you going to say something as well? <laughs> Um, I just think that you're, what you were saying about people losing interest and not going to shows, et cetera, is not just in the UK. I think it's a worldwide problem. It's happening in a lot of countries. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, I was in Switzerland, Switzerland last year, a big dog show in Switzerland and a lot of big all-rounders. After lunch one day, they're all sitting around and they, they talked about the future of dog shows and uh, some said, give it 10 years. Seriously, and some said 15 years. So I think I might go with the 15 years, but things have got to change. Yeah. And they, these were people who should know because they travel the world. Yeah. So watch this space. I won't be around in 15 years, but remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, will I, because somebody had murdered me by then. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> never, Becky, never. 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 Uh, I'll get these protections, darling. <laughs> Jimmy, you'll be on YouTube forever. You will, you will. So, yeah, we can quote you. So, it's we've done our two hours now, and I'd just really like to say thank you to the audience for attending today. I hope you've got something out of it. I hope you've enjoyed listening to us. We tried to answer your questions. I hope that you go away and really understand what a breed should be, whether you're golden retrievers or you're you're watching from another breed, but really understand, really study your breed. You won't learn everything quickly. It takes a long time for knowledge to layer in, but every opportunity of exhibiting or judging or breeding is an opportunity to advance your skills and knowledge. So, you know, we're here, you've got massives of resources. If you've got any questions, drop me an email. I'll be quite happy to try and answer them. Um, for the UK judges going through the JEP, if you do need any mentoring, again, get in touch because there are some opportunities coming up. I'd like to really thank our panel today. I think you, you, you've spoken from the heart you've given it a really good crack and I think everything that you've talked about has been really really valuable and, and I can only thank you all and particularly for Sandra getting up at five in the morning and Jose for doing it after a hard day's judging um, and sometimes when you're judging and it's difficult it's actually hard work you know so um, you know we've extended your day probably by a few hours and I'd like to really thank um, Anna and Ricardo as well um, for helping us to organise the tea time chats. And um, I do hope that it won't be our last one, but um, it will be available on YouTube for you to watch later on. Um, and everybody have a really lovely evening and enjoy your dogs. Thank Thanks, you. Penny. You are a wonderful chairperson and you are so knowledgeable. So, 10 out of 10. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely brilliant. It's been great to be part of it, to be honest. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad, you know, we wanted a wide perspective on things. And sometimes when you're not quite entrenched in a breed, you, you can bring some very valuable things. And also, politically, you can speak fairly freely. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank so you. have a good day, everybody. Yeah. I mean a good <laughs> <laughs> to bed, Sandra. Yeah, bang to bed. <laughs> yeah. Bring us for another drink. <laughs> <laughs> Take care now. Bye bye. bye. Take care. Thank bye. you for inviting me. Oh, you're Thanks, most welcome. Bye. bye.